as we prepare to come near to the Lord together. Let's go to God's Word together. Uh, the passage for today is found in John chapter 15, and then verses 1 through 16, and we are going to read in a resp- responsive way together, and then I am going to start with verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me, he takes away, and every branch that does, he prunes that it may be. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be mine. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If I, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You But I chose you and appointed you that you should go. So that whatever you he may give it to you. Amen. Let's pray one more time. Lord, that we look to you for your word. And then as your servant shares what you have placed on my heart, we pray that your spirit, that you will speak to us where we are. We thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Right now we're going through the farewell discourses on chapters 14 through 17 in the book of John. And then last uh, three Sundays we looked at passages from the book of uh, John 14 where a lot of emphasis is in do not worry, do not let your heart be troubled. And as Jesus is leaving the disciples and then going to the cross and then beyond. But here, chapter 15, it's a little different emphasis. And then here, the passage that we have read together, it's a very familiar passage, and you know about this passage, and then you are very familiar. I'm sure that you have heard many sermons on this passage as well. Uh, Whenever I read this passage, I think about a sermon that I heard when I was in college, and that's a few years back, and then it was a a very good sermon that captured a lot of uh, different elements in this passage, and kind of, it went like this, and uh, you know, this passage, uh, the the person that, you know, that taught and preached, and said, our life is about really bearing fruits. The secret to your life is having fruits. And the secret to having fruits is that here scripture teaches us that you need to abide in the Lord. And secret to abiding is to obey. And then secret to obey is to love. And then secret to love is when you identify together with a person And then you're able to love the person because he's your friend and because he's your child or whatever that may be. And then when you love that person, you're able to obey. And then when you obey, then you're able to stay close to that person. And then when you abide, then you're able to see God doing changes in your life and bearing fruit. And then when you become fruitful 
and then you will live a good Christian life. And that was kind of the, uh, the outline for this passage. I, still to this day, I think that's a really good understanding of this passage. Uh, but, you know, that's not the end of the sermon. I'm going to just uh, revisit some of those things to think and share together with you a few things and that are simple but important. As we think about spiritual maturity and then spiritual fruitfulness, and then as we prepare for the retreat where we want to draw near to God and then be fruitful as God's people. And these are something, simple things, but nevertheless important things that we want to think about together as we look at this passage. And there are three things that we want to just think together. And the first one is this. When Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is a vine dresser, and then you are the branches. When Jesus says, I am the vine, and you are the branches, Jesus is speaking to us and reminding to us about a very special relationship. And in the Bible, we know that is a relationship where we say it's a relationship that is a union with Christ, that we have become one with Jesus Christ. And understanding this, I think it's helpful. Becoming a Christian is not just a learning about what Jesus taught or saying what we believe and then saying it, although those are important part of it. Or it's not just adhering to some of the code of conduct, although how we serve other people and then do the religious routine and then ritual and then other things are important. But what's important to us is this, that we need to experience this oneness that Jesus is talking about. That it involves about Jesus being in you and then you being in him, that union that Jesus is speaking here about. You see, it's much more than just joining a company where you are one member and then works for a big company. No, it's much more than that. And Jesus says it's an organic relationship. And what's much more? And in other passages, it says, Holy Spirit, when we place our trust in Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit takes us and then baptizes us and makes us baptized into Jesus and makes us one with Him. And so that when we talk about where does your identity lie in, and that is your identity lies in Jesus Christ. Whoever, whoever is in Jesus Christ is a new creation. Old has passed away, new has come. And then Paul talks about it, how we were baptized into Jesus, to Jesus' death and resurrection. And what Jesus has done now is transferred to us. And then we experience this. This is a, a mysterious, mystical thing. But this is what we need to think about and understand. When we think about the work, finished work of Jesus Christ and how that applies to us, and then we can think about because we have become one with Jesus Christ in our struggle with performance because of Jesus' righteousness and we are justified. And then because of what he has done and because of what he has done, our sins are covered. And then because of what he has done, we know, although we're looking for approval and then wanting to have a right relationship, we are reconciled to God and then we know about that. But you know, one of the things about being made right with God again is this. Although we still struggle with, hey, I'm still a bad person. I still fall, and then I am broken, and I'm messed up. And how come that I don't change so much? But the thing is, when we were made one with Jesus, we became born again, and then we became regenerated. And then we now have the life of Christ living in us. What I'm trying to say is this. Christian life is not just you learning how to pray better or how to do more things or understand more about how you can have a successful life. It's really having Christ's life 
living in you. And how Christ's life in you bringing changes in so that through you we bear Christ's fruit. It's about Christ's life in you and through you. What's it interesting here is this. In the section that we read, the word remain, remain, remain is repeated about 11 times. The word remain is uh, the word that can be understood as dwelling or dwelling place. But John chapter 14, when Jesus said, I am going away and then I am going to prepare a dwelling place for you. And Jesus promised that he's going to prepare a place for us in heaven. And that's John chapter 14, verse 1. But another interesting thing is 1420, Jesus says, when you experience Holy Spirit coming into your life, as you continue to walk with Him, and as you continue to allow Him to lead in your life, you will begin to see, through the work of Holy Spirit, God and the Father and the Son will come and make His home in our hearts. And that's what earlier chapter talked about. It's very interesting. This is very mysterious. As we allow Holy Spirit to continue to lead us, He's going to reveal more and more and more of Christ's presence and then Father's presence and then our heart will be like heaven where He will be living together with us. But here, The section that we're reading, Jesus saying, I am your home where you need to come and live. Remain in me. Abide in me. Think about this huge building. And think about this building as Jesus. And there is a storm and the rain outside. But when you are inside, the rain will not affect but because you are inside and then when you become a part of the owner and part of the family member and then all that is within can be yours. And that's what we know. Because we are in Jesus Christ together with Him. All the spiritual blessings now become ours because we have become a child of the living God. It's kind of a mysterious, like, what are you talking about? Well, remaining in Him and then having Jesus live in us, it's a mystical thing. But when we understand that Holy Spirit took us and then made us one with Him, and because of that union with Christ, that we are one with Him and then we lived this life. Let me think about it like this. If you want to grow as a Christian, and then if you just uh, scan and think back of your life, and then you do not have the evidence of Christ's life inside of you, or Christ is not whispering to you, and then Jesus is not leading you, burdening you, challenging you, and just speaking to you, if you do not have Christ's life, in you, I want to ask you to perfectly reconsider whether you really are made one with Jesus Christ. But if you have Jesus' life in you, the life of Jesus in you, it's a powerful life. You know, I heard about a pastor that went and visited a, a tomb and where it was very nicely built with a, a slab of marbles. But as he was marveling about that structure, he noticed and there was a huge uh, uh, oak tree that uh, uh, that cracked through uh, the structure. Uh, Why? Because as they were building that structure, a little acorn, little acorn fell in. And then, because it has life, it began to grow little by little by little by little by little, and then it was able to break through the boulder and then that marble, and then was able to come out and became a huge tree. 
if you have Jesus living inside of you. Even though you may not experience it little by little, little by little, the life of Jesus that brought resurrection, the life of Jesus that brings new life to those that come to surrender their all will continue to bring about change in you. Change in you. As you learn to know that you and the Lord Jesus are made one. And then you have this union with him. I hope that that's not too confusing for you. But for me, it helps to see when I think about myself, oh, you know, I'm not changing much, and why is it that I'm such a selfish person? But regeneration, that Holy Spirit living inside of me made me a new creature. Yeah, that's why. Because of that, we know little by little, little by little, as the Jesus takes hold of my life, and I know that I will become a new person. When you look at somebody, oh, that person is pathetic and helpless and hopeless. Not if, not unless when Jesus enters into that person's life and forgives and renews and gives him a new heart and new life, whoever the broken sinner that he or she may be can become a new person. It's Christ's life in us bearing fruit. What kind of fruit? It's not just winning people over to Jesus Christ. Um, sometimes we think, oh, I have led 20 people to the Lord, or 30 people, or I'm doing all these activities. No, it's Christ-likeness. How Christ changes your attitude, how Christ gives you a new perspective, how Christ enables you to serve and love others, and Christ, how He does work inwardly and then that is expressed outwardly. Christ's life that is expressed in so many different ways are the fruits that are born when you know and let Jesus be the leader in your life. Second thing that we want to just think together is this. The verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Now, we know about this union with Christ, but here we see that the Father is a vine dresser, and then what he does is he uses his clipper or knife and he cuts off a lot of things. Here, he does two kinds of cutting. And the branches that does not bear fruit, and then he cuts it off, and then he gathers them, and then he throws it into the fire. And that's what he says, and it burns. Now, the question some people sometimes we have you know, at that place is this. Does that mean that you are a Christian and then when you're not bearing fruit that uh, you can lose your salvation and you could be thrown into hell? Uh, it sounds like it and that's what sometimes people might think. But, you know, we don't want to press the metaphor too much. Okay, We don't want to build a theology on this metaphor. But I think we could understand it like this. You know, do everybody that comes to church go to heaven? And do all the pastors go to heaven? Maybe, maybe not. Probably not. And then do people like Judas Iscariot, and then who learned a lot about Jesus and was in fact doing ministry together with Jesus, and there is a, no, you know, the pastor that says he didn't cast out demons when other people cast out demons, that he didn't heal the sick when others did, but... Here we know that somebody like Judas was never really somebody that belonged to Jesus. And then places like this, we know that God the Father cuts them off and then releases them. 
But what's more shocking and surprising is the next part, and that is this. The branch, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. Here, it says not to the ones that are not bearing fruit, but to those that are bearing fruit. The father comes and uses the clipper and cuts off many stems and cuts off many things so that already they are bearing fruit, but that branches will bear even more fruit. Uh, when we lived in Wisconsin, we had a, a, a little uh, yard and then we had some bush over there and uh, in the springtime come and then you know we need to just uh, use a, 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 a clipper and just cut off a lot so that, that it will not grow, go wild because you need to just cut off a lot and so that it will be contained and then manageable but here especially vine you know for it to produce good grapes you need to cut off a lot I remember and uh, one of the was a lady uh, the, 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 that I knew who owned the orchard and then who was, uh, had a, a, the Korean pear tree. And she said, Pastor Cha, you know how much we need to clip off and how much we need to trim for us to have not just the small ones, but huge ones. We need to keep cutting it off so that the nutrition will not be diverted in many different directions, but it will go to the ones that need to bear good fruit so that the fruit that it bears will be a big, juicy, and good one. And that's what the Father does. Is it a pleasant thing when God the Father brings a painful thing and then cuts off things in our lives. No, but he does it so that we will be more fruitful. If the goal of our life is about our happiness, and then he will probably just leave us alone, but because of the goal is for holiness and then helping us to be more like Jesus. Whatever that does not belong, that will not help to produce Christ-likeness in us, the Father cuts that off. And that's what we see. And I was uh, thinking about my daughter, you know, when she was uh, uh, two or two or two and a half, I remember she had some kind of a viral uh, uh, infection where she had a, a cold sore kind of a thing in her uh, mouth, about a hundred of them on her tongue and in her mouth, and then she was in much pain. And then as she was going through it, I was hoping uh, that I could go through it in her place. You know, I wasn't there, and then sitting by her side when she was just having a hard time eating or not able to drink anything, and then I was there just uh, thinking and hoping and praying, God, can I go through what she goes through instead? That's when I realized that's the attitude and heart that Father has toward us when we go through things or when he allows us to go through difficult things. But there are some things that we have to go through so that we will learn to grow, so that the God will learn to trim away our desires, our hearts, our treasures, our purpose, and our aim, and then what we desire, so that our desire and aim will be more like Jesus Christ. And that's what we can think about. You know, whenever there is a difficult thing that happen, you know, the rather than diverting the life of Christ away from bearing the fruit more like Christ, Father clicks off and then and just uh, cuts off many. And then many times when the clickers come and it's like bleeding and it's painful and uh, he allows us to go through it, but many passages we know, like Psalm 119, it was a, a good thing that I was afflicted because I have learned your statutes. And then we know because of a difficulty, 
that we come to experience his grace and then death of renewal. You know, as I was thinking also about some other people that I know that has, are, uh, that has a very special dedication to serve the Lord, and many of them have experienced difficulties that they encounter through illness and through loss of job or many other things. But in the midst of those difficulties, that when they turn to the Lord and cling to the Lord, and then God came through again and again, and then God used those opportunities to renew them and draw closer to them. Uh, there is a book called Don't Waste Your Cancer by John Piper. It's a simple, small book, but these are the 11 titles of the book, and I just wanted to read it to you. We waste our cancer, and then he had a cancer, he went through it. Uh, if we do not hear our groanings, the hope-filled labor pains of a fallen world. We waste our cancer. If we do not believe it is designed for us by God, if we believe it is a curse and not a gift, we waste our cancer if we seek comfort from our odds rather than from God. We waste our cancer if we refuse to think about death through the difficulty. And then we waste our cancer if we think that beating cancer means staying alive, when in fact, rather than cherishing Christ. We waste cancer if we spend too much time reading about cancer and not enough time reading about God. We waste cancer if we let it drives us into solitude instead of deep, deepening our relationship with manifest affections. We waste cancer if we grieve as those who have no hope. We waste cancer if we treat sin as casually as before. We waste cancer if we fail to use it as a means of witness to the truth and glory of Christ. As I was just reading through just the titles, it reminded me, yes, God does allow painful things to come in our direction, but when those painful things do come, what we should do is we should cling to the Lord, and we should surrender to the Lord. We should learn to place our trust in him and then learn from what he's teaching us and learn to obey because our good father here who is a vine dresser what he does here he cuts off everything that diverts the energy and life of Christ so that we will have one passion one desire that is to seek him and him alone to be more like him. Two things we talked about. First, union with Christ. Christ's life in us brings fruit. Second, our Father is the one that is a vine dresser and then he purges us and then he makes us pure and clean to become more fruitful. The third thing is what you and I need to do to remain and stay close to Jesus Christ. Here, you know, remain in me and let my word remain in you. As you're going through a tough time or difficulties, rather than just reacting emotionally, what will you need to do is uh, go to God's word and then take God's Word, read it, not just to get information and allow God to speak to you through the Word and the promises of what He says about what He does to His children and then promises about His character and those things, let that dwell on your mind and let it be on your heart. And those are important things. Or remaining in God's love. Learn to know his love and then continue to love him. And those are some things that you already know. But you know, this time around, as I was looking at and studying verse 9, this verse 9 through 11 really helped me and gave me an insight. Let me try to read this and then try to explain. As the Father has loved me, 
so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. Interesting thing here is this. As Jesus is inviting and reminding us, the disciples, to remain in him and then and let him and his word remain in us, he gives an example of how he remains in the Father and how he continued to live in that intimate relationship with the Father, and that becomes an example to us. There are three things that I want to just highlight here. Verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you, abide in my love. As the Father has loved me. You know, when Jesus began his public ministry, when the heaven opened and God the Father declared, and then everybody heard and told Jesus, You are my beloved son, and I am well pleased with you. You are my beloved. You know, soon after, right after that, Jesus was driven to the wilderness. And then what do you think sustained and strengthened him to go through the wilderness without eating food or without anything else? It was not, oh, I have work to do. No, it was the Father's love, knowing that he is the Father's beloved. You know, toward the end of his public ministry, on the Mount of Transfiguration, same thing. And then when there was together the Peter, John, and James, and then heaven opened, and then God the Father spoke and said, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him before going to the cross. So what strengthened him and then energized him to face the cross, go to the cross, it was the Father's love. Here, Jesus says, just as the Father's love helped me to love him in all the things, I love you, and you know about my love and remain in my love. I love you, and I left the glory for you. I love you, and I'm giving my life and dying in your place for you. I love you. I couldn't bear to be without you. And that's why I'm here. I love you. I love you. So as we think about how do we stay near to Jesus, know that he loves you. And you are his beloved. And learn to love him. Yes, you need to read the Bible and pray and do other things. But at the very center of it, no. That you and I, we are his beloved. Verse 10, it says, If you keep my commandment, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandment, and then abide in his love. He says, Jesus says, I have kept the commandments. And that keeping of that commandment, that obedience kept me near him in love to him and jesus here says learn to let god's word dwell on your mind and on your heart but what god says to do do it when god tells you to obey obey it so that as you are doing it and living in obedience you know that you will see that that will really keep you near and that is really staying near to God's word and keeping God's word in us. One more thing. Here Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be full. Learning to obey and walk the path Following the Lord's leading. You know, the obedience looks pretty, not so pleasant. But when you walk and follow, it becomes sweet when you follow. 
And then you begin to experience the joy that comes when you learn to obey and follow. Just because he tells you to do it and you did it and so God coming through and using you to encourage and bless others and just because he told you in the word to do it and you did it and you are beginning to see something about God you did not know before and just because he's telling you to do things as you're learning to walk in obedience the things that other people do not know about. Sweet joy that comes when nobody else might understand but knows that you are where you are because God has put you there and doing what God is asking you to do and then you don't have to seek approval for anybody from anywhere and you know that God is pleased with you and then he delights in you and then as we see that and experience that we begin to experience more joy more joy. Well, I thought this was a, a, a very helpful insight. At least that's what I thought as I was just studying this time. Yes, you need to read the Bible, let God's word remain in you. Yes, you need to love God and love others. But as Jesus himself, through obedience, though being the son, he learned obedience. And then he is inviting us to learn to walk in obedience so that we may experience joy and the life. Let me try to wrap up with one more thing, and that is this. In verse 7, if you remain in me, my words remain in you, and ask anything, and then it will be given you. Uh, is Jesus requiring us to uh, just pray a lot so that we will stay close to Jesus? No, after thinking about it this way, I began to think more like this. No, as you know, oneness, that you are united with Christ and you are one with Christ. And then you are experiencing the Father cleansing you, purifying you, make you more humble, more like Christ in your heart, in your attitude. And then as you are learning to walk in obedience and then staying near to him, you remain in me, my words remain in you. Then ask whatever you wish. And it will be given you, and through that, by this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So prove to be my disciples. What I'm trying to say is this. You know, that how do you have the answers to prayer and the evidence of God doing many miracles? You can pray for two hours, three hours, long hours of prayer may result in God answering and then responding. Or when you become somebody closely, intimately walking with him. And then when your heart is going through surgery, renewal, and purified, and then when you desire to obey Him, and that's your desire, and as you're seeking to grow in that way, as you are walking more intimately with Him, as you desire to see Christ be exalted in the lives of people that are going through a difficult time, as you are seeking to see Christ be lifted up where you work and with the people that are going through whatever difficulty it may be. As you pray, as a person that I'm now more in tune with God and walking in obedience, here, promise of Holy Spirit, Christ working through, answers to prayer that's going to take place at work as you're praying for your family member, as you're praying for your situation, as you're praying for different people, people that you teach, because you're seeking to live before God and walking in obedience through your prayers. Now, not just your life change, much fruit, evidence of Jesus' life that comes through 
here. Well, what I share together with you is not a new thing. I'm sure you heard it about it many times. But I thought, you know, it's a helpful reminder for me and for us that our Christian life is not about doing more things. It's not just learning more things. It's really about Christ and his life. I hope that you and I will focus and pay attention to Christ in you and his life and what he whispers to you. And I hope that even when God the Father brings difficulty and then hardship, that you will not say, oh, what's wrong? I need to avoid pain at all costs. No. Here, Father specializes not just in doing little changes, but deep changes, deep renovation. And oftentimes it requires making us to be very humble, broken, so that we may be renewed to be like him. And then learning to stick close to him, you know, remaining in him and letting him remain in you so that relationship of oneness with Christ will grow and there will be more and more and more and more evidence of Christ's life in and through you and through us. Let us pray. How is your relationship with Jesus? Is there evidence of Christ's life in you? I'm not asking you whether you're doing your quiet time or whether you are in the small group or serving. How is Christ's life in you? Are you in the midst of a challenging situation and difficulty that you're facing? Rather than avoiding, would you surrender, cling to the Lord, and say, Lord, what are you doing in my life? What are you teaching me? I want to learn, I want to grow, and I want to obey. Would you let him have his way in you? Learning to abide. Learning to live. Not because, oh, do I have to do this? No, living as his beloved. Jesus came, gave his life for you. For you. And then you are his beloved. And Jesus saying, walk with me. A distance. I want you to experience the joy of walking with me beyond just the little things. So that you can experience Christ in your life very much for it. Lord, continue to speak to us, meet with us, renew us, make us to be people that will stay near to you, cling to you, And make us the people that learn to experience the joy as we learn to follow you. In your name we pray.